Hello, welcome back to the Cricket Nerds podcast. You've got me and James today. Uh, and today we are talking about what ended up being quite a thriller between India and New Zealand. Um, it looked like it was India's game all the way until Michael Bracewell did some pretty insane stuff. Um, but let's get straight into it. So I think we need to talk about Shubman Gill, maybe. Oh, maybe. Um, maybe that he's just like the next best thing. Like, the unbelievable level of consistency from Shubman Gill mm. um, in ODIs in particular yeah. is absolutely unreal. Like, bear in mind, he's played 19 ODIs now. Um, he's averaging 68, which I'd say 19 ODIs is a decent sample size. That's, yeah. that's no no trivial amount. And he's averaging 68 at over a run of ball. Um, that's outstanding. Like he's staying in and he's scoring runs and he's not wasting deliveries. Yeah. Um, and this is a this is something that we've kind of been looking at for India because um I'd say India's biggest weakness going into uh, just in white ball in general is when they're batting first, they're too conservative um with trying to set a total. I would back India to chase down most totals in any white ball format against any team. Mm -hmm. But when it's setting a total, you, you need to be aggressive. And Shubman Gill, I think, balances it perfectly. He played a Kohli-like innings where he he was measured, but then he accelerated, you know, kind of once he got over 100, which Kohli does all the time as well. Yeah. Um, he then really accelerated and he ended up going at a clip just under 140, mm. which is perfect because that's that does it, it meant that India got up to 300, 350 almost. Mm. Um, and everybody else just you know couldn't really keep up with him. Yeah, no one did really anything else. The high, next high school was 34, um, which shows you how how much Gills runs are needed, I guess. Um, I think one of the amazing things about Gill's innings is the fact that he got to 200 which doesn't happen that much like there have only been a few 200 scores so for him to do that shows that he is in a a different league in a way because not many people have done it but you're right about him being like Coley because you're right Coley would do the same thing would play the same sort of innings and the one day format gives you that time to build your innings and show your class Whereas 2020, you see a lot of guys with huge shoulders scoring 30 off 10 balls and it being the best thing ever, put them in a one-day situation or a test match situation, it's not sustainable. Whereas you've got to have that different edge, I guess, for, for one-day cricket, uh, which India's top three in Rohit Sharma, Shuman Gill and Virat Kohli today, they have that ability to play those awesome innings. Um, mm. Whereas someone like Suya Kumai, Sorry, Yukumar Yadav, he's in this phase at the moment where it's, yes, he's been picked for the test side because he's got talent. Yes, he's in this one day, one day side because he's got talent. But we mostly see him just smacking it from ball one in 2020. So it'll be yeah. interesting to see how how he adapts. Um, Definitely. But, but another I, I've thing... got a little stat for you, sorry. Yeah, go for it. Because um, I know you love a stat. Oh, yeah. Um, and you were talking about, like, there have been a few a couple of 200 scores um, I was just looking at the 200 plus scores in ODIs. There have only ever been 10. Um, and so there have been First one, being two. Safi Tendulkar, isn't it? Yep. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different people have set those, have, have scored 200 plus. Mm -hmm. And of those eight that have ever scored 200 plus in ODIs, one, two, three, four, five, five out of the eight. Indian, mm. Indian, Indian uh, batsmen know how to put on a big score. Yeah. Like that is an out, that is an incredible stat when you think about it. Um, not a single Englishman in there. You know, no. it, it's it's Indians and batting big. Um, that that's a cool little stat I, I yeah, found interesting. Definitely. Yeah, and also. India have that ability with these players who are able to score big scores in one day cricket to score big in one day cricket. And we've seen it over the last series in Sri Lanka as well. India are consistently posting big scores. Um, 
if you go back 10 years, if you got 300 in a one day game, you'd be like, oh yeah, that's a really good score. Um, mm. Whereas now they're getting 350 plus at a consistent rate, um, which is really hard for, for other teams to chase. It's just that extra bit. And if India can do this in the one day World Cup, then it will it'll be really good for them. Because when you look at the last World Cup, when England won, going into that, England were used to doing all these big scores and then it got to the World Cup and the pitchers offered a bit more for the for the bowlers. And we weren't seeing these massive scores. England actually lost a game where a team scored less than 300 and they weren't able to chase it down. So these things happen. It's whether when we get to the World Cup, the the Indians decide, let's just have some batting-friendly pitches and we'll see lots of runs. <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess there's a I bit think more freedom in a bilateral, isn't there? There is, yeah. And India, we know, are brilliant in bilaterals. Um, World Cups is where it really kind of mm. it, it, it tests the metal a little more. Um, yeah. But I think one factor that's going to really impact on whether you know India do well in the World Cup is if the umpires still hate them, because uh, Hardik Pandya got absolutely mugged. <laughs> Yeah, he was robbed a wicket there, as in his wicket was robbed. It was an oh, absolute yeah. burglary. Um, so you know, uh, Tom Latham, the keeper, uh, goes to collect a ball that Daryl Mitchell had bowled. Um, it's beaten the bat. It's also beaten the stumps. And Latham, in collecting the ball, has knocked the bales off with his gloves. And you couldn't say you couldn't see it in real time. It you know it at first I thought it was out. I, I thought that it was bold, um, because the bales lit up as the ball passed, and I was like, "All oh, right, cool." But it turned out in slow mo that it was very obviously the gloves of the keeper that took the bale off, and the third umpire, obviously Hardik owes him money because he just said, "Nah, bud, you're out." <laughs> Yeah. So it was it was the that was one of the weirdest dismissals and weirdest th third umpire decisions I've seen. Mm. Um and it definitely put uh put India a bit of jeopardy there. Fortunately, you know, they were the, the tail managed to stick around long enough um to, to let Shubman guide them home. And Shubman Gill on 182, then hitting three sixes in a row, three lofted straight drives. Oh, he is a superstar. Like the, the thumbnail, like the thumbnail says, he's a superstar. Yeah. It's the way it's the way to do it, isn't it? If you bring up your fifty or a hundred with a six, that's awesome. But to do it with three sixes in a row, that's just oh. that's just next level, isn't it? Beautiful, outrageous. Yeah. But another thing on that that Hardik Pandya wicket is, I think third umpiring has been questionable over the last few years. And for me, it comes down to some umpires take too long over dismissals, whether it's maybe they're, they're judging whether the ball's hit the ground before a catch has been taken and they take forever or they rush it. And I think sometimes third umpires just need to take their time and then once the evidence is conclusive, then make a decision. Mm. I don't know. I don't <laughs> know if the umpires kind of feel like they need to it like when you're watching because you get to watch the third umpire's video you get to see what they're seeing and so often you can watch a, a team where a neutral's playing so you've not got any bias whatsoever and within 20 seconds you're like yeah i made the decision and the third umpires just seem to be it just makes them look stupid in a way i don't know if they feel pressure to make a decision yeah. i don't really know what it is i i think um I think you're absolutely right. In the ones where it's more obvious, like it's more clear cut, like the one today, mm. take your time over it. All right. Get the right decision because it's so blindingly obvious that yeah. if you if you balls that one up, then that's a real mark on your career. Mm -hmm. But the ones where it's like, oh, was it grounded? You know, the real like, I've got no idea as a neutral, mm. I can't tell. They're the ones where I think they need to make a snap decision. Just like, what was your first instinct? Yeah. And they should almost write out what their first instinct was. First time they watch the replay, say out, and then they can rewatch it. And if it, if they can't, if they really can't decide, you go with whatever your first instinct was.
because yeah. that's how umpiring should have been done. It's how it has been done, you know, historically. Umpires get things wrong. That's a part of the game. But yeah, I, I completely agree that some of them need to take a bit more time because there's no excuse for getting No, that, definitely that. not. Right. The soft signal is a it's an instinct, isn't it? And so mm. often the soft signal just doesn't say what actually happened. So I think having umpires almost giving the third umpire almost giving their soft signal from a slow down view. Yes, they might not get it exactly right, but yeah, you're right. Just write your gut instinct, and that's that's more important than the soft signal in a way. Um, yeah. yeah, New Zealand's innings because uh, obviously the bowlers yeah. were all right until they came up against Shubman Gill. Um, it was very much India's game, as we said. Mohammed Siraj. He was brilliant. He had a brilliant, was. Um, brilliant spell of bowling. Yeah, and you know, up top, um, it made a huge difference. Just the amount of movement that he was getting, um, the the bounces that he was bowling. He was bowling some really potent bounces, mm. and it it did unsettle them a bit. Um, Devon Conway looked well. It just looked uh, looked a bit uncomfortable. Um, and it was a, it was a very nice catch from from Kuldeep Yadav. I thought. Um, I, I just thought, yeah, it started off so well, and Kuldeep Yadav, I thought, bowled brilliantly at the start. Yeah, he's great through he's great through the middle as well, isn't he? He really is, yeah. Um, and he, he takes those those middle over wickets, and then somehow the wheels just came off. Um, oh, by the way, uh, shout out to Shabaz Ahmed who took an absolute you know dream catch. Um, yeah, he just did very well. RCB. Uh, but yeah, I mean, RCB, that's what it is. Um, but yeah, Michael Bracewell, it's not many people that can sort of outshine somebody that gets a double turn in a day. And Michael Bracewell came very close. 140 off 78 rocks. It was yeah. absolutely amazing. He's like a typical New Zealand cricketer. He's... Like if if you said pick someone in like your top twenty cricket all rounders, he wouldn't come to mind. But he's just been a great player for New Zealand over the last however long, and he's just come up with an awesome innings like that. And then just to top off the the New Zealander about him, it's not enough to win the game. <laughs> 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 and and I think what we're seeing with. New Zealand at the moment is they've got some solid players. They've got players like Finn Allen, Devon Conway, uh, Daryl Mitchell, um, Glenn Phillips. They've got some solid players, but they've not got they've not got that standout player. Like Kane Williamson is the standout player in Test matches, but I wouldn't say he's the standout player in One Day Internationals and Twenty Twenty re- Internationals. He's got a good record in those formats, but he's not a a standout. He's not like a Joss Butler, Virat Kohli. They've not got one of those players in one day cricket. And I think part of that is that New Zealand, they all kind of chip in, um, which is fine until everyone has a bad day. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, kind I think of, you're absolutely right. So I think if, if Michael Bracel had had that innings and then someone in their top six had also hit like a 70 or an 80, then it could have been a completely different story. Mm. Yeah, I, it really could. Um, but it was, Somehow Bracewell was just seeing it amazingly. Ten sixes, um, all of them were big. <laughs> and uh, it has to be said that the bowlers were bowling some absolute filth. Um, Hardik Panja, I thought, bowled horribly. <laughs> like he was bowling, you know, back of a length and unimaginative bounces that were just quite slow and easy to pick. Um, and yeah, you know, I think Einstein once said that. Uh, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results and by that metric I think Hardik Panja had been drove insane by his own dismissal well, I, I, <laughs> might, just... I might blame, uh, you could blame his dismissal I actually blame Rohit Sharma because when Hardik Panja was at Mumbai Indians under Rohit Sharma there was always that question mark over whether he was injured so he couldn't bowl or if he was not injured and could bowl but i've never seen hardik i wouldn't i never rated hardik panja as a bowler especially in 2020 cricket Mm. and then he gets the captaincy for india and he plays for gujarat titans his bowling's awesome 
comes back into the one day side under Rohit Sharma, his bowling's back to terrible again. So <laughs> I don't know if it's just the yeah. he needs the, think it's the a... responsibility as captain, maybe. Yeah. To, yeah, I don't know. Do you think it's another case or, you know, another case put forward for Hardik Pandya to be the future captain of India, uh, replacing uh, in the white ball system? Because at the moment, you know, they, mm. I think a lot of people are kind of looking at Rohit's captaincy and saying, look, you know, this, it's not bad, but it hasn't been winning us games. No. Um, and the ones that we have mm. been winning have been pretty close. So, you know, is there a case? Maybe. I think as a as an all rounder, you get to see all parts of the game. You know what works, what doesn't work, and we've seen with with England with Ben Stokes as the captain, that's worked really well. Um, I think Hardik Pandya at the moment needs to be the twenty twenty captain, just out and out twenty twenty captain. Rohit Sharma's obviously did really well as captain for Mumbai Indians and has done well as captain for India, but when you look at the teams he's had, like he's not, I, I, you'd never say Rohit Sharma's got like the best captaincy now in my opinion <laughs> i'm sure i might get hate in the comments for saying that <laughs> but i feel like there are better captains in that team like in a way i know he, he's a very wears his heart on his sleeve sort of person but i would say that virat kohli had his better captain than rohit sharma um I, I would, even though I would, even though in the I ipl agree. rohit sharma's had a better record rohit sharma's always had a better team mm. so yeah yeah, I'm inclined to agree. Should we move on to some CNQs? Of course. Um, now, if you want your CNQ, which stands for Cricket Nerds Question, uh, to be answered in the next video, leave a comment down below with hashtag CNQ. And then, yeah, ask us anything, uh, preferably cricket related, but mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be. Um, and we will do our best to answer it in the next episode. So the first one we've got is from Samrat Manor. And he has said... How can India fit Ishan Kishan without dropping Gill? What are your picks on that? And also, I saw Joe Root in the uh, ILT20, and he looked good. So that was a little note from him. Yeah, I, I thought he did look good. Uh, Joe Root opening. It's a different yeah. sight. Yeah. But yeah, how can India fit Ishan Kishan without dropping Gill? I think they do slightly different things. I don't think mm. Ishan Kishan needs to open. Um, I think Ishan Kishan can fit at kind of three. Uh, what what do you think? Well, I reckon with the talent he's got above most of the other Indian players, Shubman Gill fits into that team. Like especially given his innings today, you need to get him in the team. Whereas Ishan Kishan, I don't think he's done enough to cement a first eleven slot. So he's, he's hit a double hundred as well, though. I know. Oh well, yeah, true. Ishan Kishan's great, right? Let's not. It's not take away from that. Ishan Kishan's a great player. But I reckon that Shubman Gill in one day cricket is more suited to it in terms of... Now, Ishan Kishan's the sort of player who, when it comes off, it's awesome. But Shubman Gill, to me, strikes consistency. He'll get you at least 30 runs at the top of the order and the odd time he'll play in innings like today. Whereas Ishan Kishan, for me, is more like a six or seven runs scored one day and then... 150 the next is it's a bit hit and miss yeah see because the ishan kishan he played um his last odi before this one mm. was when he got 210 fair enough and then he was dropped opposition <laughs> so, uh oh that's a good question uh let me just quickly check for you Bermuda. <laughs> I don't know. um right he was opening yeah. He was opening in that one. And he went at 160. Who was he playing? Uh, that was against Bangladesh. Okay. Yeah. So, and Bangladesh aren't a bad ODI squad at all. No, but they're not. I feel like that's even. their strongest format. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I definitely see your point. I think as far as like which players I like watching or whatever, um, I, I do think that Shubman Gill is just a nicer batter to watch. Mm. Um. But that being said, you know, I think he's he is relatively consistent. Like he played against uh Luck now. Sorry, not Luck <laughs> He played against South Africa um Look in October. And he got uh 10, 93, and 20 there. Yeah. So you're right, there is a bit of an element of flash in the pan and then very good. Whereas Gil is 
a bit more consistent, but mm. I still don't know if he's if he's worse than anybody else. And now that it, Rishabh Pant is obviously injured and out for however many months, yeah, I, I I think Ishan Kishan definitely has a good case put forward, more so than Surya Kumar Yadav, in my opinion. Yeah. I think I think Sky has shown that he is incredible in T twenties, but he hasn't really translated it to ODIs yet. Uh, give him a chance, I reckon. Yeah, yeah, obviously, you know, with a guy that he's got such a high ceiling. But um, yeah, just saying that I think Ishan Kishan deserves it more. All right. Um, next CNQ that we've got. Let's have a look. Um, we've got uh, from, oh, he doesn't have a name, user something, uh, says... India should give give a chance to Shivam Mavi in ODIs also, as he is one of the best in ODIs in domestic cricket. So as in like list A. Uh, what do you think? Do you think Shivam Mavi should have a have a chance? Anyone who's I'm known good. in India gets a chance eventually, don't they? So I'm sure I'm sure Shivam Mavi will get his opportunity, especially since he's made his T20 debut fairly recently. Um, so yeah, I can see Shivam Mavi having a go, see yeah. what he does. There's a lot of Indian players who are really good at this point in time, like bowlers. Like you've got Mohammed Shami, um, you've got Mohammed Siraj, uh, you've got Jasper Brumra, Bhuvaneshwar Kumar, Ashdeep Singh. Trying to fit Shiva Mavi in there. Yes, he might have a good record in domestic cricket, but it's like the Safaraz Khan argument. Very good in domestic cricket. How do you fit him into the test match side? And I guess maybe you should, and um, and but I don't think you India should. I don't think India necessarily take those risks as much as they should. Yeah, um, I I think Shiva Mavi could do brilliantly, and to be honest, I don't think India's bowlers put a good enough case forward to say that there's no chance for Mavi to get in. No. Um, today, so yeah. Mm. Uh, next question, nice quick one, uh, from Look Who's Watching. He said, um. Both India and, and Australia have announced their squads. So hoping for a preview episode? Yes, that will be coming soon. Stay yeah. tuned. It's Subscribe. The, yes, that series isn't actually out for a while. I think it's mid-Feb. No. As you as you we'll, we'll, we'll do a bit no, of we will, we'll do we will a bit make one. Stuff. Don't yeah. you worry. Yeah. And finally, um, from Arpit Sharma, what do you guys think of Harry Brook? Can he be the dark horse for England in the World Cup? Besto, Root, Butler, Livingston, and Moeen are starters. So you need to fill two more spots in terms of batters, I think he means. Um, I think Harry Brooks is a brilliant player. He's he's the closest thing we've got to a Shubman Gill in terms of a beautifully classy player that could play in all formats. Um, yeah, future superstar. Get him in. I don't unless there is a better middle order batter. Um for the T20 World Cup, uh, sorry, the ODI World Cup to actually win it, mm. I think Harry Brook should be in there. I can see Harry Brook being one of those players who can get your 70s and 80s, um, bring the momentum back into your favour, that sort of player. So, yeah, definitely get him in, I would. Um, he's a very good player. Now, That's James, all we've got time for. I after believe. this, After this game that we've just watched... With Michael Bracewell playing the way he's played, there's a there's an overseas spot available at Punjab Kings. <laughs> you could have got Michael Bracewell for so cheap, I reckon. Honestly, I, so I've been saying this for a little while. I I um I talked about Michael Bracewell in our preview of the um of the T Twenty World Cup. I said this guy is like legit. He's actually really good. Um, and we should pick him because he has a T20I bowling average after 13 games of 9.82. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, me personally, I would have loved to see Punjab fill their damn spots <laughs> for overseas. <laughs> but alas, they wanted to save the money. They wanted to go with what they've been doing the whole yeah. time. And we didn't want a guy that at T20I averages 30 with the bat at a strike rate of 183. <sighs> right well and with there that we go. <laughs> yeah yes. that's all we've got time for thank you so much for watching uh don't forget to subscribe we are zooming towards our goal of a thousand subscribers at a thousand there'll be a nice little rebrand 
we'll have uh, we'll have some you know fancy new artwork to go go all over our channel. So if you want to see that, you better subscribe, join the movement. Um, if you if you subscribe before a thousand, then we will love you forever. That is the only guarantee we can give. Uh, you can also listen to our podcasts. It is on Spotify, um, also Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and probably some more. Um, you can follow our social medias. We are at Cricket Nerds Pod on Instagram and Twitter. We are Cricket the Cricket Nerds on TikTok. Other than that, thank you so much for watching, and goodbye.